prepare to enter the mirror universe, we're doing things a little backward than usual. We're starting off with Darbo Integrals. Having already in the previous section talked about things like upper and lower sums, uh, this is in reference to a function that exists on an interval from A to B and for a partition of that interval. <clears throat> now we're defining two new functions, uh, this scripty L and scripty U of delta. What these are, are respectively the infimum of all lower sums across all possible partitions as long as the norm of the partition is less than delta, or the supremum of all upper sums. So the function and the interval are not changing. Okay, but for a fixed delta, you're asking for all possible partitions whose norm is less than that, what's the infimum of all lower sums and the supremum of all upper sums? <clears throat> right, okay, so once you have a single partition, you can take the upper sum. And now what you're doing is you're saying, I mean, in a sense, upper sums compared to Riemann sums said take away the guess and check of particular sample points. And this actually takes away the guess and check of what partition you went with. It asks over all possible partitions, what's the infimum of lower sums or supremum of upper sums, um, provided that the norm of the partition is not too big. Yeah, so we consider doing it for every partition whose norm is less than delta. And uh, then take the supremum of all those if we're talking about upper sums. If we were talking about lower sums, we'd take the infimum. All right, now, L of delta is the infimum of all lower sums over all partitions as long as the norm is less than delta. So if you have one particular partition P and its norm happens to be smaller than delta, its lower sum can't possibly be smaller than the infimum of all lower sums of all partitions of norm less than delta. And similarly, its upper sum can't be bigger than the supremum of all upper sums, at least amongst partitions whose norm is less than delta. So we've got our interval from A to B with our function. Here's our function f of x. If you fix a particular delta, and I'm just going to say for the sake of argument that delta is this big. Okay, the, the width of this interval is delta. Now what I do is I ask, what are all possible partitions that never involve a piece this big? Okay, so all the pieces have to be smaller than that. There can be some really, really small pieces, but none of the pieces can be this large. Then what you would do is you would take these intervals and form a lower sum for this partition. But if I was to take a different partition, at least so long, as the norm of that partition was still less than delta, possibly much smaller. Okay, the norm doesn't have to equal delta, it just has to be smaller than it. In fact, it can't be equal to it. And I take the lower sum over this partition, all possible partitions whose norm is not that big, look at the lower and upper sums, and that's how you get your L of delta and U of delta, by taking the infimum of lower sums, the supremum of upper sums. Okay. So as I, I mentioned, the proof of this statement is really quite straightforward. For one particular partition whose norm is less than delta, its lower sum can't be smaller than the infimum of all the lower sums you could have gotten, and its upper sum can't be bigger than the supremum of all the upper sums you could have gotten. The middle inequality, by the way, is just saying that the lower sum of a particular partition, notice in the middle inequality, the partition is the same. Uh, that the lower sum of one partition can't be bigger than the upper sum of that same partition. And there is going to be a squeezing going on. Notice if we can somehow guarantee that L of delta and U of delta are squeezing in towards each other, it will follow that the lower sums and upper sums must be squeezing towards each other. That is coming. Now again, this looks a little confusing, but it's fairly straightforward. Assume delta two is smaller, okay? We claim we have the following chain of inequalities. All right, now the inner inequality we've already done. The L of a particular delta is less than or equal to U of a particular delta. The infimum over all lower sums can't be bigger than the supremum over all upper sums. So the inner inequality is, is fine. Let's just pay attention to the left that L of delta one must be less than or equal to L of delta two. 
L of delta 1 considers all partitions whose norm is less than delta 1. L of delta 2 considers all partitions whose norm is less than delta 2. But if delta 2 is smaller, any partition whose norm is less than delta 2 is also less than delta 1. So any lower sum that you could possibly generate when trying to consider L of delta 2 will also be a lower sum when you consider L of delta 1. Any norm whose partition is less than delta 2, any partition whose norm is less than delta 2, is also a partition whose norm is less than delta 1. So all the possible lower sums you get here are included this way, but some partitions might have larger norms, something in between delta 2 and delta 1. They will be considered here, but they won't be considered there. So the infimum might have gotten pushed down because you're accounting for more possible partitions, namely the ones whose norm is larger. A partition whose norm is extremely small will be considered in both of these things, but a partition whose norm isn't that small might only be considered here, so maybe this infimum is actually smaller. Okay. The right one is basically the same. If you have a partition whose norm is very small, it will be considered for both u of delta 2 and u of delta 1, but if the norm of the partition is in between delta 2 and delta 1, it will only be considered here, possibly pushing the supremum up. So as you decrease the possible norms, if delta 2 is getting smaller than delta 1, I am restricting what partitions I can look at in other words, instead of all the partitions whose norm is this big, now I'm only considering the ones whose norm is this big. That is a restriction. Then the infimum must go up and the supremum must go down. That's what this says. Which means both of the following limits exist. Okay, Whatever the limit as delta approaches zero of L of delta is, we're going to call it L sub L, the limit of the lower sums. And whatever the limit as delta approaches zero from above of u of delta is, we're going to call it L sub u, the limit of the upper sums. What we've just established in the previous slide is that as delta decreases towards zero, the lower sum infimum is monotone increasing, and the upper sum supremum is monotone decreasing. Monotone functions have limits. We've already established that. Therefore, these limits exist. For the moment, they might be plus or minus infinity, but they do exist either as a real number or as plus or minus infinity. And since L of delta is less than or equal to U of delta for every particular delta, again, we already established that, this limit can't be bigger than that one. Which does rule out, by the way, that this limit could be plus infinity and this one could be a real number, something like that. That can't happen. Okay, maybe they're both plus infinity, or maybe they're both minus infinity. Or maybe this one's minus infinity and this one's plus infinity. Fine. Or maybe there's real numbers and they're just different. But the limits exist, either as real numbers or as plus or minus infinity, and then obeying this inequality right here. And we did prove that result about monotone functions having limits quite some time ago. It's true. And now we need it. That happens. I mean, there was a reason that I included it in a presentation so long ago. Um, the stuff that is given either inside the slides or as practice problems, in general, we're going to call upon it at some point. Or if it's a practice problem, it might be to drive home a point, but it might be something that we're going to need later on. So pay attention to these things. So with that in mind, here are some sample problems. Prove that whatever this limit is, the limit of the upper sums more precisely, the limit of the supremum of the upper sums over all partitions whose norm is less than delta as that delta approaches zero from above. That limit is infinite if and only if the function is unbounded above, and correspondingly, the limit of the lower sum in FEMA is minus infinity if and only if the function is bounded below. Okay, this is really just an exercise in seeing what happens to the upper and lower sums when the function is unbounded above or below. So we know that both of these limits, capital L sub L and capital L sub U, both exist, and L sub L is less than or equal to L sub U. If they have the same value, if they happen to be equal, and that is a real number, so they're not both plus infinity and they're not both minus infinity, then we say that the function is Darboux integrable on the interval, 
and the value of the definite integral is given by this notation on the left, which is of course familiar to us, and if these two limits are the same, then that is the value of the integral. This is our first definition of what an integral is. You have to be able to take all partitions whose norm is less than delta, look at the infimum of all lower sums, the supremum of all upper sums, assign this infimum and supremum a value, that's our function L of delta and mu of delta, take a limit as delta approaches zero from above. If both limits are the same, then that number is the value of the integral. Now, our first result regarding integrability of functions is if a function is integrable, in other words, if these two limits are the same, then the function must be bounded. It doesn't necessarily work the other way. A function can be bounded and these two limits are not the same. In other words, the function is not integrable. But if it is integrable, then the function must be bounded. The proof isn't actually that complicated. Suppose the function is not bounded. It's either unbounded above or below. Let's just assume it's unbounded above, possibly below as well. It doesn't really matter. Well, a previous practice problem shows that when the function is unbounded above, this capital L sub u will be plus infinity. Therefore, well, L sub L and L sub U might be equal, they're definitely not the same real number because L sub U is plus infinity. And therefore, by definition, the function is not integrable. Uh-huh, a function which is unbounded above has unbounded upper sums. That's essentially how you prove that previous practice problem. Yep. I mean, it's, it's hopeful that these results are reasonable once we've internalized the definitions. Okay, what functions are integrable? Well, let's start with a fairly straightforward example. If a function is constant, then it is integrable on any interval you want. Okay, for any partition, any piece of the partition, the function is constant, and therefore the supremum and infimum of the function are that constant value. Okay, so if the function is constant, well, it's not gonna be very hard to draw a constant function from A to B, Okay, it wouldn't be hard for a reasonable person. That's about the best I can do for a horizontal line. But now for any piece of the partition, from xi minus one to xi, the function is still just constant. And therefore, the supremum is the same as the infimum, which is just that constant value. So what's gonna happen when I start taking upper and lower sums, and then asking for supremums of all upper sums and infimums of all lower sums? Well, every single piece when I'm making a lower sums, sees a value of c. So any particular lower sum is just c factored out of this sum, gives me the sum of the lengths, but that's just c times b minus a. But exactly the same thing would work for upper sums. For every single partition, not only is the lower sum equal to the upper sum, it's exactly this value, c times b minus a. So if I take the infimum over a whole bunch of different partitions. Well, every partition gives me the same lower sum, and the infimum over a constant number is just gonna be that number. So for any delta, the infimum of all lower sums of all partitions whose norm is less than delta is exactly this, but that's also the supremum of all upper sums because they all take the same value. So L of delta and U of delta are constant functions. They are this number always. So what's the limit as delta approaches zero from above? of this constant, well, that constant. So this limit and that limit are the same and they are this number. So not only is the function integrable, we actually determined the value of the integral. It's c times b minus a. It's whatever that shared limit is. Okay, here, however, is a function that is not integrable on any interval of positive length. It's one whenever the number is rational, but if you plug in an irrational number, you get out of zero. This is called the indicator function of the rationals. It indicates whether a number is rational or not. So for any partition and any piece of the partition, we know that any interval contains rationals and contains irrationals. Since the interval does contain rationals, the interval does contain points where the function is one, and that's the biggest the function ever is. So that's gonna be the supremum but the infimum will be zero because the interval also contains points where the function evaluates to zero. This is a bounded function, okay? But it's doing some really weird stuff. Yeah, we have established previously that this function is nowhere continuous. It's been an example in our sort of uh, arsenal of functions of a function that does really bad things. And we're seeing here, yes, it continues to be bad. It is not integrable. <laughs> 
So for any partition, the infimum on every interval was zero. So for any partition, the lower sum is just zero, but the supremum on any interval was one. So the upper sum for any partition is always b minus a. Now the picture for this, just imagine you have one piece of the partition from xi minus one to xi. Okay. Now the function, it's very kind of impossible to draw, but if you plug in a rational number and there are rational numbers in the interval, you get out one. But if you plug in an irrational number and there are definitely irrational numbers in the interval, you get out a zero. Now, I never go larger than one and I never go less than zero. So the supremum is always one and the infimum is always zero. And this is for every single piece of the partition. Okay, so since the lower sums are always zero, the infimum over all lower sums of uh, partitions whose norm is less than delta is also zero. And since the upper sum is always exactly b minus a, regardless of uh, what partition you take, if you take the supremum over all partitions whose norm is less than delta, you still get that same constant b minus a. So the infimum of lower sums is always zero, and the supremum of upper sums is always b minus a. And therefore, those are the limits, okay? The lower sums have limit zero, and the uh, I should say the infimum of the lower sums has limit zero, and the supremum of all upper sums has limit b minus a because they're just constant functions, l of delta and u of delta respectively. And since we assumed the interval was of positive length, b minus a is not zero. So these two uh, values, zero and b minus a, aren't equal, and therefore the function is not Darbo integrable. And what we're exploiting, yeah, is that this function goes up and down a lot, and I'm, a lot is uh, seriously underselling how much it goes up and down. It's jumping between zero and one infinitely often on any interval you want. So the upper and lower sums never have the opportunity to be close to one another. But a continuous function won't have the problem. Well, we'll actually see that's correct. A continuous function will be integrable, but uh, that does take some work. And that work, Put off for another day. Okay, so in the next video, we'll address a different definition of integrability, the more familiar Riemann integrability.